Hello, viewers. My name is Javon Wilson coming to you with another exclusive here for 284 Media. Now, as we can recall, on June 19th, the government of the Virgin Islands was formally notified by St. Vincent and the Grenadines officials that a case of COVID-19 was confirmed upon arrival from the British Virgin Islands. Ever since, the government has not only made a decision to lock down the entire island of Jasmine Dyke, but additionally, we see all persons, that is 300 plus residents, being subjected to mandatory COVID-19 testing. Today, we speak to some of the residents about how they feel about government's decisions and overall how they've been coping with this pandemic. So stick and stay with us. There is more after this commercial break. Is business slow? Cash flow down? Hosting an upcoming event? We can help. Advertise with 284 Media and take your business or event to the next level by enhancing your present marketing and messaging strategies. Allow our team of experts to create a personalized ad that sets your business apart from all the rest. This could be your business or event. So, what are you waiting for? Contact our marketing team at 284media at cctbbi.com. Advertising with us works. Viewers, as promised, we are speaking to some of the concerned residents of the beautiful island of Joss Van Dyke. We all love it uh, for various reasons, but today in a very different breath. COVID-19, as we know it, has affected not just residents in the BVI, but across the world. Um, and really, when, as it relates to some of the decisions coming out from government, not everyone seems to be on the same page. So today, I would like to welcome my guests. Uh, beginning with Miss Justine Callwood. Good morning, Javon. We also have Dwayne Donovan. Uh, evening, Javon. <laughs> oh, good afternoon. And we also have Mr. Cedric Chittery. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. So welcome to all of you guys, and thank you so much for this opportunity to speak. Now, let's just piggyback a little bit. Even before recently, COVID-19 has happened, uh, quite an unprecedented pandemic. Just speak to us very briefly about how each of you have been coping with this crisis. Uh, Justine, you want to go first? I guess I will. Uh, I was okay. kind of waiting for you to jump in. Um, <laughs> I, I, think, I think personally I've been coping very well with the, the, uh, this whole pandemic, possibly because I'm a bit of an introvert. Um, but I think we, we've kind of come to a place where there's a bit more of a push and we're beginning to get to a, uh, an area where we're feeling the need to have a more, more of a dialogue with our government as opposed to being given definitive orders uh, as to how we should go about life and asking going forward, you know, what will be the new structure? Is this how it will be for the, in the new regular, or can we establish a, a better dialogue? I think that's a very important point, um, because one of the things we tend to go back to, especially as it relates to government officials and decisions, uh, people tend to be reminded, uh, remind government of the fact that they were elected by the people for the people. And so it's important to encourage dialogue that will affect the livelihoods of residents across the territory. Uh, Mr. Sendrick, um, I know you kind of put your day on pause just to facilitate this interview. How have you been coping with uh, this, this crisis? Well, you know, it's been, uh, it's been uh, quite tough for us being a business person uh, we have seen our business uh, drop, uh, you know, I mean, very, very uh, large drop. And, um, but we have been trying to uh, basically cope with it um, and, you know, trying to abide by government guidelines. For example, on, on the ferry, we make sure that we have persons, um, you know, wear their mask, uh, practice social distancing. So we have adopted uh, to the government's guidelines and um, some folks, I believe, have even felt um, that we've been going overboard a bit too much because they said, well, hey, you know, we don't have any cases. Why are you making sure that we wear a mask? But that is the way that we have been making sure that we, as a, as a business in the community, making sure that we uh, we want to make sure that everybody remains safe. 
And um, so we've been trying our part, doing our part where that's concerned. Awesome. And Mr. Donovan, how about you? Um, well, honestly, I have always been the type of person to try to always look on a brighter side of life. So, right. you know, despite whatever challenges may face with this whole situation, um, I try to remain optimistic. That being said, it is a fact that, you know, I'm, I'm in my house right now, which was still being repaired from all my damage. And then COVID-19 hit and it's like, wow. You know, so economy of, basically. Wow. Yeah, you know. And then the economy will crashing down and it's like just for like is such a unique place in its in its essence because we depend on tourism and this whole COVID nineteen thing basically shut down the whole tourism industry. And us being over here, um, like I say again, predominantly dependent on tourism, it means that most of the establishments are closed down, Foxy's Justine can speak for that. Foxy is the main one. Foxy is taboo. And so it's like we basically left to deal with, you know, looking for construction or whatever other, you know, means there is in the community. And in a sense, that's why I was, to some extent, not forced in a sense that I didn't want to, but had to drop back on trying to reestablish and um, even strengthen my land spirit academy business that I started years ago to be able to say could continue to provide some kind of you know financial security for my family. Um, that being said, the whole thing came as a shock because you go to sleep, um, you know, the night before, and you wake up the next morning and you're under a curfew, and then you realize they're trying to have mandatory testing for something that. When you really pull the facts, you go to the St. Vincent News Networks and you pull it and you read the, the facts of what they put up there and there's no consistency in what's being said. And then our government here automatically jumps on that and gives us this red light that says, hey, stop everything you're doing, everybody on lockdown now. And when we're asking questions, we ain't get no response. Right. Like, what's all of this? Understood. Yeah. Mr. Donovan, I think that's where the disconnect comes, um, like you said. Uh, so for persons who may not be okay with what the situation is, uh, the person that traveled to St. Vincent uh, was seemingly a resident of Joss Van Dyke. Uh, according to allegations, the individual left Joss Van Dyke just about two days prior to leaving, spent two days on Tertola, and eventually mm -hmm. made her way on to Joss Van Dyke. Now, as a result of that, uh, the government decided on, I think it was on July 19th to the evening of, into the 20th. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, guys. I think that may be the timeline. Like you, Mr. Donovan said, uh, they went to sleep the next morning. There were these new restrictions. The island was on full lockdown for seven days. Uh, that will run up until July 28th. And I'm sure that must be an uncomfortable situation to be in especially since many residents may not have had food or even had the opportunity to get themselves ready for this decision. Well, I could tell you from, from on my end, um, you know, this curfew started um, Tuesday morning at 1 a.m. Okay. And, um, you know, I woke up at, uh, at 6.30 um, to a, uh, a WhatsApp message that was being circulated. Somebody got hold of a WhatsApp message and started circulating it around. Somebody called me and said, you know, what's going on? Are we on lockdown? I said, what are you talking about? And they said, you know, there's this, um, this coffee thing going around, this coffee order. And I said, that can't be, that must be like fake news or something. So, um, I jumped on the phone and um, called somebody who would know. And um, I did get confirmation that, yes, this thing was official. So I was like, wow, you know, at this time, you know, the ferry boat is getting ready to um, to leave to go to Tartal with passengers. By the time I got a hold of the captain and said, listen, this, uh, this coffee order is official. The boat had already left the dock. He had to turn around. Um, he had to, um, let the passengers know, listen, we apologize, but, um, guys, um, we cannot go to Tartal again. 
um, he had to refund all those angry passengers um, their money. And um, it, it's just been crazy, you know. Um, that was, we had the, the barge going to Tartal as well. All that trip had to get canceled. And um, up until that point, there was no official word, um, no official word out at all. You know, so this is the sort of way that, that this thing actually um, came about. And and the, and the funny thing about it was that this coffee order was put in place when there was no testing carried out up until that point. So um, you also had a situation where this was a week later after this person had left the island. So during that week, you had persons visiting Josephine Lake for the past seven days. You had persons leaving Josephine Lake, coming to Tortola for that past seven days. And so if there was some risk, you know, of transmission, imagine what could have happened within that seven days. Understood. But, but the point Understood. is that this coffee actually came into force without no evidence of a positive test on the island of just one like there was no cluster there that you could say hey we have a bunch of positive cases you know and that right. was a rush a rush to judgment so would you say then because based on some research that we would have been able to do here at 284 media in other countries where there is like a mandatory testing guidelines uh, it's subjected to persons who were in contact with the individual proven to have been in close contact with that individual or even uh, contacts with the primary contacts. In this situation, we see a very aggressive, uh, stringent approach to quarantine, uh, lockdown, I should say, and uh, do mandatory testing for the entire island. Would you say that some residents feel victimized by this decision? Oh, most likely, most definitely. For sure. Um, the thing is, too, is like the residents of Joseph and Lake, I could say largely have not been leaving the territory to say like we left and came back in or something like that. I could right. understand if like we were traveling to St. Thomas, like I understand right now from Totola residents are going to St. Thomas and coming back. You know what I mean? And I say that because I myself is trying to, you know, basically get um, certain members of my family over there to, to visit family members, right? And so the procedure is you need the house, the government, and they would have to give you okay and what's not. And I imagine, well, okay, if I was to be the one going down to come back upon entering St. Thomas, then I would have to do testing because, you know, they want to protect themselves as well. Coming back in, I would expect to do testing. But I don't see why where uh, someone that was staying here that left the island for maybe three or four days before they left um, Tortola on a flight from Tortola to flight to Vincent to the warrant for everybody and just for they to be tested when she passed through Tortola, which at one point, you know, the whole reason why the BVI got locked down was because somebody came into Tortola that was COVID-19 positive. If I am mistaken, that person came in, it was um, Alayat Harnies, and I started the whole cascade of everything. Um, stating another fact would be when they had the incident with the Filipino lady at Gloria's residence. She died, right? And they put, I guess, the building on a lockdown, but they didn't let lock down the whole area. Right. And they didn't make testing little. And that was a death in the territory from a positive COVID case. We didn't have nearly that kind of situation here in this one, like, but they put us under such stringent conditions. So it makes you wonder, like, is there an ulterior motive behind that whole situation? You know, on top of that, adding extra security around our borders on the water, the, as if just for like, is a nation of itself. No, we are part of the, the British Virgin Islands, yeah, just like the rest of the islands. And you know, it just makes you wonder, like, is is all of this really necessary? Like, you know. Understood. Now, one of the things um, I know is of major concern is the testing. Um, I mean, we cannot be shy about the fact that this is not an easy test. Um, majority of persons would say, you know, it's slightly grueling. Have you guys done the test as mandated? 
No. <laughs> I personally have not, okay. nor do I intend to, unless there's a substantive discussion about our rights as they've been previously violated up until this point and how those rights will be um, carried out in the future. I mean, when one wakes up in the morning to a mandatory uh, testing procedure with based on a cabinet decision without the representative in cabinet, as is typical, but to not be notified, nor for there to be any actual follow-up or personal approach from our leaders, coupled with the uh, notorious fact that these tests are inaccurate frequently, both positive and negative, and none of the others, the several companions she was traveling with tested positive for the test. Not only that, there has not been any follow-up on the part of our government or the Vincentian government, except for a house visit where she continues to abide with other members she traveled with um, who tested negative. So they haven't had a second test, nor as far as I know, has there been any follow-up from our government to confirm this first test, Do you know? All right, so just speaking to that, um, one of the things in speaking to Honorable Carver Malone recently on a press conference uh, calling, uh, I think someone called in to say, why not go to the source herself instead of placing these stringent measures on an entire island? Why not speak to the victim who she was around so that we can actively and effectively do contact tracing? Um, and you're saying that you have been in conversation with the victim and the victim's family. Um, can you say if she's been exhibiting any symptoms related to COVID-19 as we speak? She has not. She, like the people of Yost Van Dyke, have no symptoms uh, and do not feel sick. So All right. this is another fact in terms of us questioning why this mandate has been put into place so quickly and what other mandates could potentially be put into place against our will and enacted with such um, quickness, shall we say. Understood. Now, there, that brings me to uh, a term called false positive. And even prior to this interview, we interviewed a young lady from, well, that lives in the BVI, a reporter from BVI Beacon who had a similar situation. Um, she did have the symptoms, but according to her, may have been tested, um, I shouldn't say wrongfully, but what we call a false negative. And that is when someone has the, the virus but was able to test negative. In this situation, it seems as if uh, a false positive may have been possi uh, possible because a false positive comes when the individual tests positive but shows no symptoms. So in reality, that individual may not have even had COVID-19. Uh, based on what you're saying, there's no symptoms. Um, no one around her has tested positive. She continues to abide with individuals who she would have traveled with in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And according to what you're saying, no follow-up test was done either by St. Vincent or the local government in the BVI. To my understanding, oh, that is correct. I, I, I go just ahead, wanted Dr. to say, oh, go ahead. Um, I was about to say, like, I know what, what I'm about to say might have some people thinking that this is just all um, I'm basing on is like a conspiracy type of way. But let's look at some things about COVID-19, right? Some of the symptoms is so common to the flu. It's so common to having a cold. It's so common to having, like, heck, 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 even just a regular headache if you are, like, out in the sun too long and your temperature rose too high. Like, these things that's so common to, like, almost everyday life. Every year, flu season comes around, you get these symptoms from different things. And I realize that what's happening in other places is that they're talking up every little thing they can to this COVID-19 pandemic. And, it, you know, it just... It starts to make you wonder, is there some kind of consistency throughout the world for governments to use this as a time where they start to crack down in a way where they infringe upon our rights without giving us the ability to really have that say, to be like, you know something, this don't make any sense. Or what you guys are doing, you're not giving us a chance to, to like, they have discussions about the decisions that they're making. 
You know what I mean? And I say that because even from the St. Vincent standpoint, I posted on the on Facebook um, about the news um, reports that they put up on the St. Vincent news. And there's an issue when you go and you look at the numbers that they place, aside from the written war that they placed there, if you really follow the numbers that they place, the numbers does not add up. They tell you for us in one instance, right, that they had 15 cases in one of the news reports that was, um, I guess, new cases or whatever. And they tell you out of them 15 cases, 12 was from a flight, a AA flight from Miami, 945. And then they tell you they had three new cases. You read down four, they only account for two cases. So then there's that one case that's like a mystery case. And one of the cases that they account for, and they're saying is, was the mystery case coming from that order? So they actually leave two cases where they don't really account where they're coming from. Fast mm. forward to the next news report, there's an issue where they count in 21 afterwards. And then they plainly tell you that the six new cases, four of them was again from another AA flight, right? Or the same AA flight or something like that. And then they tell you afterwards that the other two cases was from Antigua and Barbados. Nowhere okay. did they mention having any solid confirmation to say this thing was something that came from the BVI. And then having a young lady at home sitting in a house, observing no symptoms and, you know, didn't have anything but like the negative test results. What's this all about? You know, is a question that you start to really ask. <laughs> Yes, and a young lady sitting at home, uh, possibly COVID-19 positive based on that initial test, um, showing no symptoms clearly, but nevertheless, we see an entire um, island and the livelihoods of people being put on pause um, as a result of what's happening with government's decisions. What is the atmosphere like on the ground, uh, Mr. Chinry? Well, the atmosphere really right now, to be honest with you, is that... Um, uh, just when like has has a a stigma attached to it at the moment. Um, anybody uh, from just when like somehow um, you know other places, whether total or other places, would just look at us as um, you know, hey, you guys have the plague or something. You know, there's something keep bad going there. on over there. That's really the impression that has been um, given. You know, and it's it's almost like as if the way to 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 vindicate to be vindicated right now to clear a name is like perhaps to go do this test <laughs> to prove that hey look we are negative or something, you know. But um, that's really the situation right now. It has created um, a situation where. Even if somebody, let's say somebody from Tortola wanted to go just for like uh, on a staycation, you know, the economy is already so bad over over there, over on just for like, um, but it's going to make it even 10 times worse now because, you know, uh, it's like you're going to be making people say, hey, you know, we don't want to go over there. Um, I and, 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 and I think that that's wrong. It is wrong. I can't imagine, uh, just based on what we've seen locally, there's a extreme level of um, stigma and discrimination attached to this disease. Uh, would you say then that these decisions um, are almost like complementing that or supporting that? Yes, definitely they are. I mean, I, you know, I want to make it very clear, you know, um, you know, I, I am really in support of the government and I know that they're trying their best, you know, to keep us safe, you know, but, um, when you have a situation like this, um, uh, that comes about, I think that somewhere along the line, um, they, they acted on, on some misinformation and, um, and also they acted on some, um, some facts that were not complete, you know, they acted on some incomplete facts here. So, you know, I would really like to see that, you know, in the future, uh, number one, you know, that persons from just from like are treated um, with a bit more respect, you know, and, and this, uh, this situation right now is only one um, in, in the bag of so many situations uh, where, 
just when like people are being disrespected. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. you can talk about and roads, you can talk about <laughs> so many things over there. And um, you something know. I'd also like to add about the atmosphere on the ground. I think what so much solidified my decision not to take the test was hearing about the experience of a fellow Joe Van Dyke Islander when he informed the medical personnel that he had no interest in taking the test. And the general reply, and I paraphrase, was that, well, I won't have to treat you medically if you are sick in a few days. Wow. And it's this level of essentially, I don't know, outbursts of fascism and reactionary responses with fear that I think are becoming much more apparent in our community. And so for me, it's not about saying the test is bad. It's just that there's a process you have to go through in order to subpoena somebody's DNA samples. Right, and right. I think that the government should know that. I think it's part of, and I think a BVI law on some level, and if not, it should be. So this is a time for us to be able to start a conversation with them in terms of what their long-term intent is in response to COVID-19, because we were initially told this idea of flattening the curve. And now that has changed to this idea of zero cont- and containment, as if it can be contained, to be honest, as if it can be contained waiting for a vaccine to keep us all safe. And I understand that that seems like a logical progression in some people's minds, but it is not a logical thing in everybody's mind, and certainly not mine. So if, no, if, mind, if, we, <laughs> if we can establish what the government's long-term objectives are, and they can be honest about that, we can honestly entertain a dialogue as to what our response is. But passing a bill in the middle of the night and not having any personal interaction about it, nor explaining, nor defending the facts, many of which we have raised here today, uh, to the people seems like it, it was a deliberate, deliberate oversight one that could be easily rectified in an age of WhatsApp and Zoom and several other media outlets. Yeah. Yesterday, uh, Mr. Erad Pata, that is the chief medical officer, um, of course, we reached out to him as it relates to this issue. And one of the things he said is, if persons opt out of taking this test, they will be mandated then to be quarantined for 14 full days. How do you guys feel about that now that you've decided that, you know, this is not something that we're willing to do, at least not at this point? Well, if, they, if they're saying that we need to be tested and we refuse, then hey, I've been comfortable in my house for the last couple months when they've been saying, you know, we can't leave, we're on full lockdown and what's not. And, Again, this is my whole thing. At that point, Just Van Dyke was still out here in isolation. You know what I mean? We was in our houses, couldn't leave, couldn't, you know, go elsewhere, couldn't, obviously couldn't go to Tartola. And that was based on one or two cases that they found on Tartola. They locked down the whole BVI. Now, with this situation, again, look at the facts. The young lady left here. Um, several days before she left. She stayed in Tartola several days before she left. Went and did her hair, did her nails and stuff like that. It was, you know, in a hotel, went out to eat, all these different things. And they act as if Tartola had no part to play in her reaching St. Vincent and supposedly getting tested positive. And on top of that, downplaying the fact that she, that they probably wasn't even talking about her when they talk about the, the positive test. Because if she's in a house, with a negative test, according to sources that speak directly with her, exhibiting no symptoms, what's the grounds for this? Again, you know, it's a question that keeps popping up. You know what I mean? And it's wow. like, I don't, I don't want to make it sound like we, we, we're trying to follow suit with the states and feel like this whole thing is political. But honestly, they're pushing stuff in our face that could make us simply think like that. Right. If that you know conversation I mean? is not had... Um, I fully agree with you. And, and in addition to that, we've also heard that a lot of our officials 
were on the island around the time in question, and they are not sure if they were subjected to testing. Um, and I know another concern is with the children. Um, the children are also mandated to be tested. So there's a lot to go around. As we begin to close, what would you guys like to see from the government at this point? We're already at a point where it is mandated. If you opt out of it, you are required to be in quarantine for 14 days. Um, and in light of everything that has happened uh, between then and now, what would you want from government at this point? Well, I, I just want to clarify um, that uh, this lockdown actually um, actually caught me on the other side of the, the pond. In other words, I'm actually on Tortola at the oh, moment. Wow. And I'm, I'm doing this, this interview from in my car on Tortola. So um, you made a point there earlier about persons who actually did travel to just one day. And, um, you know, and so if those persons um if everybody on just for night need to be technically travel to just for night. You know, I myself uh, personally, um if I have to be tested, I don't mind being tested. But um, you know, that's the situation we have. Um the persons who um who are on Tartola, the lockdown um caught some people on Tartola like myself. It caught other people on just for night who would have wanted to travel to Tartola. So, um, you know, like I said, it happened at a, at a, at a rush and, you know, that's, that, that's how it came down. Okay, like, interesting. Something else has to be addressed. I think we so much don't have a formalized list of demands as just a general concern about how our rights seem to be capable of being shifted. I mean, the late night decision, the implementation and the way in which it was done, but also coupled with, as I said, this threat by medical personnel of fear, combined with the fact that we have kids that are supposed to be going back to school and who are supposed to be graduating. And now, apparently, the word is, is that if you refuse to be tested, you yeah, and graduation. And graduate even though graduation is before the, the uh, test results would come back. So wow. testing actually wouldn't indicate whether people would be allowed to mingle or not. It would just determine whether they had the virus before or not. And with a test that has given notoriously faulty results, it's hard when we're having our entire lives dictated by it. And that's a very, very strong yes, point and shared sentiment across the world, Justine. Go ahead, Donovan. That being said, I mean, I did post publicly and, and ask for, I mean, some people probably feel like I was being a little rude and out of place by asking for the premier, which was one of the officials that was on the island, to be tested to, you know, a show of good faith that we are in this together. Because as you said, Sometimes these government officials forget that they are human just like us and that we put them in place. And so they are not above being tested if the rest of us are to be tested as well. So it should never feel, we should never allow our government or any government anywhere in the world to feel like they have absolute power when the people is exactly the ones that gave them that power in the first place. Unless it's coming to a point where we're going back to monarchies, where if you are in power now, you will continue to be in power because you pass it down your bloodline. The, the, the system of democracy says otherwise, says that the people has a voice and we have the right to use that voice to make sure that we are treated fairly and appropriately because those that are in power are indeed human just like the rest of us. Understood, and I think uh, the, the phrase that coins it says, we lead by example, we practice what we preach. Uh, I just want to thank all of you guys for sharing your sentiments. Um, this is a very uh, big issue that we've been trying to cover over the last few days as we examine not just what has happened to Jocelyn Dyke, but how we are reacting to this pandemic. Um, and some persons have said, it's, as opposed to managing this crisis, we may be just reacting to it. And so in trying to bridge the gap, we saw it necessary to have conversations like these, and we will continue to seek answers to the various questions, not just for Joss Van Dyke, but across the BVI guys. Thank you so much once again.
Thank you. Thank you, for Thank you for having us. All right, viewers, this has been another 284 Media Exclusive. My name is Javon Wilson, and it has been my pleasure. Thank you for joining us.